I would like to ask all of you, ideally in the order in which I um, introduced you, to say a few words about um, your career so far, um, how you got to where you are, and then I have a couple of prepared questions, and then we have plenty of time for people from the audience to ask questions um, to our data science industry folks, yeah. Sneha, do you want to go ahead and say a little bit more um, about um, yourself and your career path? Yes, absolutely. Um, I did prepare some slides so that I don't forget uh, what I plan to say. Um, I'm going to try sharing that. All right. So, Looks great. All right, I go to presenter mode. There we go. So this is the first time I'm doing something like this. So please give me any feedback uh, if you uh, on this presentation. But um, yeah, so I'm Sneha and I'm here to share my career story. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I, as Yana mentioned, I uh, like most of my career that I'll talk about here, you will see that they are my main interest. Um, they are driven by my interest in programming as well as problem solving. So let's quickly recap some uh, major life events. I was born in uh, Varanasi, which is a small town in India. I, uh, for my high school, we moved to Delhi, which is uh, the capital of India, big city. And um, that was a major turning point for me. And I'll talk about why a little later. Um, and then I uh, did my undergrad at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, uh, in bioengineering, then moved on for master's in bioinformatics at iSchool at UIUC. After that, uh, I... <clears throat> My first job was at Intelligent Medical Objects, and I was a data engineer there. I worked there for approximately three years, and now I'm working at Meta, and I joined it with Facebook, and I, uh, I'm finishing up close to four years there. So let's zoom in a little bit on some of these events. Um, so as I said, like high school was a turning point for me because they would uh, like the quality of education was just so much better there and they would have a lot of like math competitions and stuff where i realized that i don't suck at math um and then they that, that was also high school was also the first time that i got introduced to databases sql and there were like c plus plus programming classes i realized that I, well, I, I guess I, I enjoyed those classes, but never realized um, my, that I was like interested in computer science or anything like that. Um, moving forward, um, when I got uh, when I got undergrad, I my major was bioengineering. Uh, quite frankly, that was not planned. That was not something I thought about. That's basically what I got. Um, I in my first year of undergrad. I had course again, like a general computer science course on C language that again was very interesting to me. So that prompted me to keep taking more computer science classes <laughs> in, um, at, uh, in my undergrad. Uh, I slowly realized that uh, like, I didn't notice time when I was like writing a piece of code. So I continued taking more electives in the CS department, taking courses like data mining, which is what it was called before it was, um, it was like machine learning and stuff, I guess. Um, in my last year of uh, undergrad, I got introduced to bioinformatics, which is the intersection of biology and computer science. And I thought that this is something I could really enjoy doing. Um, so I did my senior project in bioinformatics. Then I applied for master's um, in bioinformatics and I, um, I did uh, master's in bioinformatics from high school. It, and the flexibility of the program helped me to continue taking CS courses. And I worked on a lot of machine learning projects with high school professors, including Yana. And um, I liked what I was doing and biology kind of became one of the applications of data science rather than my main focus. Um, then after I graduated from 
my master's, I got a job at Intelligent Medical Objects as a data engineer. They used to have a center in Research Park then. I'm, I'm not sure if they still have it. Um, they, um, they hired me for my uh, database skills as a data engineering, which I uh, did not know what, what it meant then. Since then, like I have learned to interpret the role of data engineering as something in the, on the intersection of data and like coding. Uh, IMO was a small company back then, and I got the opportunity to dip my fingers in a lot of pies like um, dev, DevOps and data migrations and so on. They also gave me the opportunity to try software engineering for a few months. With um, experience at IMO, I was ready to switch to uh, like bigger, uh, larger scale data sets and um, using like cutting edge, like tools and technologies. And that, uh, that basically led me to my work at Facebook. Um, and Meta. Um, so at first, for the first two years at uh, Meta, I worked on the business communications team, which is a team that helps businesses that are on the Meta platforms to communicate with their customers. After two years, I found an opportunity in responsible AI team, uh, which was a relatively new team like two years ago when I joined the team. And there was a lot of opportunity to uh, do my work ground up. So I've been there in that team for two years now. It's been super exciting. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much my career story. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sneha. It's so exciting to see what you have um, been doing since you um, graduated from here. Henry, do you want to go ahead next? Yeah, I don't have slides. Um, Perfectly fine. Fine, because my career was largely unplanned anyway. My, my intention was to go to medical school. Uh, I had no intention of going into high tech or computing, but at some point, I did a rotation in a biophysics lab in graduate school. And I, I had done some undergraduate research in a molecular biology lab and, and I liked it. But when I went into a rotation in a biophysics lab, I got hooked on the computing and got off the clinical track, decided to pursue research and never looked back. And so I, I really enjoy programming. I, I got my first computer when I was a sophomore in high school, which was very unusual back then. Uh, I think I'm older than most of you. And so my parents said, we'll pay for half of it if you pay for half of it, but you have to take programming lessons. And so on Saturdays, I would go learn how to program and take programming lessons. And so it really clicked with me, uh, the computational aspects of it. And so I did my, my graduate research in uh, computational molecular biology, which I love, but with each successive research project from graduate student to postdoc to staff scientist required more and more computing power to the point where the, the computational science sort of pushed out everything else. And that's where I had to focus. That's where I had to devote most of my time. And so I left, uh, I left research. I was a cancer researcher. And so I left research and moved to Computer Sciences Corporation. Uh, that was when I was director of scientific computing at the High Performance Computing Center. And at, around that time, parallel computing was starting to take off and the Human Genome Project was in full swing. And so from Intel's perspective, um, it's really important that bioinformatics algorithms and computations perform well on Intel hardware. Okay, so that was my role when I joined Intel back in 2000. Uh, it was really important to make the, the algorithms that were critical for the Human Genome Project run well on Intel platforms because it was driving a lot of revenue. And so my role was to make sure that these algorithms performed well and if they didn't perform well, figure out why and solve it. And so most of my career at Intel was in parallel computing, uh, algorithms research and high performance computing. Uh, but after about 
10 years, I started getting bored with it. And I joined the master's program at Northwestern Medical School for medical informatics because my intention was to switch over to the Intel Digital Health Group. But as I was finishing that degree, Intel spun off the Digital Health Group. So it combined with GE Healthcare into a separate company. And I didn't want to go to that company, but I didn't want my master's to go to waste either. So that was when I enrolled in the Illinois program uh, for information science. And I studied at Illinois um, informatics approaches to measuring chemical exposure from consumer products. Okay, a project I found really interesting. And I got my dissertation to the point where I could finish it remotely and then rejoined Intel. And I, I get to take advantage of a lot of things that I learned uh, at Gislis. And I think I told Yana that one of the key things I learned was network analysis and graph analytics. And I do a lot of graph analytics now inside of Intel. Okay, it's becoming a really important algorithm. And so once again, if it drives revenue, it's really important that these algorithms run well on Intel hardware. And so that's my job now. And I did an internship with SNEA. Uh, you weren't an intern though. I think you were a staff, uh, staff data engineer, but I was an intern in the same group with SNEA and Intelligent Medical Objects, uh, where I got to see, you know, uh, Intelligent Medical Objects is a company that floats on an ocean of data. And you know, turning that data into profit uh, was a big deal. And so, you know, I, I took took the skills I learned at Gislis and I apply them now inside of Intel, and it has been really beneficial. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Henry, for giving us a five minute summary of your uh, many years career. Uh, exciting to hear. Kenyatta, let's hear from you next. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, so happy to be here today. Uh, uh, let's see, where do we begin, right? I'll start when I was about 16 years old. <laughs> um, I was applying for jobs at Taco Bell and Meyer, and uh, I, I didn't get it. <laughs> and so a year later, at about 17 years old, I went on to work for the government um, at the Construction Engineering Research Laboratory. Um, I believe, uh, Henry, it may have been the same uh, place that you worked, the Construction Engineering Research Laboratory yeah, for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, which was an amazing experience. It began at the age of 17, a seven-year almost uh, research experience for me that I took with me into uh, undergrad as well as uh, my graduate school. I ended up working for them after I graduated. I have a um, uh, so I was always interested in the intersection of technology and human beings. How do humans use technology? Why do they use it? Um, what are the challenges? What are the pain points? That's always been something I've been very fascinated with. Um, my undergraduate degree was in sociology. Um, however, I was a little too afraid to pursue something in programming, right? So this is for all the uh, <laughs> female identifying people in the room. I'm so happy that you have found this space because that was something that I was just a little timid about when I first began. Um, so I pursued something that I quote unquote thought that I could tackle and that was a degree in sociology. Um, but I was always interested in technology and I've always also on the side did programming and learned how to build websites and pursue entrepreneurial endeavors, right? Um, so I graduated uh, with a degree in sociology, went to work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in a full-time role. Uh, when I was an intern there, uh, study electro-osmotic pulse. <laughs> it was really, really interesting, right? Um, but uh, when I went back, I say I was one of few people who graduate with a bachelor's degree in sociology and actually go work in, in research, right, um, in the sociology field. And so I went back, um, I was in a sociocultural department, and we were responsible for helping to build um, knowledge bases and tools for combat use. And so that was really interesting. I did that for about two years. Um, but then I got tired, right? I was a quadruple minority. And uh, I didn't have windows in my office. <laughs> I guess those were assigned to all of the commanders who were on the outside of the, the space or whatever, but uh, it was a little boring. And when I say quadruple, 
I mean female, I mean by age, I mean by discipline, right? Being a sociologist, I mean also uh, as an African-American woman in that particular space. I went on to uh, pursue a master's degree in information science um, uh, at Gisless, at the I school, let me say that, uh, at the I school contemporarily. And so that was a great experience. It's where I met Yana, where I took a lot of foundational courses in terms of uh, entrepreneurial IT design, network analysis, things like that. And it really helped to uh, just strengthen and uh, perfect this area that I always desired to be in, and that was technology. Um, I graduated with the master's degree, and because I didn't know what I wanted to do, I went to go pursue a PhD. I always wanted a PhD, and I was a little afraid to uh, stick my toes in the water. Um, for full-time employment, but uh, uh, got the PhD, uh, participated there, um, did some amazing things. I want to thank the iSchool for so much support. I spent a lot of time in the Technology Entrepreneurship Center. I want to encourage people also to explore that space. Uh, participated in the COZAT New Venture Competition, was a part of a student startup um, named CREPMO, uh, Cloud-Based Rehab for Mobility, where we created wearable technologies to enhance um, uh, shoulder uh, shoulder pain and, and injury. And so that was a very great experience. Through that PhD program, I was also able to participate in a few internships. The first one was at Adobe in San Francisco, wherein I studied um, uh, young people and the social media use. And so after that, and I wanna say, I applied to a lot of places and it was just so random. It was a miracle. They called me on a Wednesday. I was employed by the next Monday. So I wanna also encourage people to keep at it, right? I applied at Facebook the first year, I did not get it. I got some experience, I came back, I did another internship at Facebook. Um, it was a, a wonderful experience. That internship turned into a full-time offer. I went on after I graduated. Well, I was still working on the PhD, but I had moved by then. Um, I was not on campus or anywhere around. So I went on to work at Meta for about two years working on ads. I was in the billing space and I talked to large global advertisers all over the world about how they process payments and their experiences running ads on the Facebook platform. So that was a, that was a great thing. It was just so awesome to be at Meta. Um, I know you guys see that dip that's currently happening. Um, this is not financial advice, but I encourage you to buy it. <laughs> I'm very bullish on Meta and the Metaverse. I just wanted to stick that in there. I do work at Twitter. Um, so <laughs> I, spent, I spent two years at Meta uh, and now I've transitioned into a senior role here at Twitter. And so I'm so happy to be here. I work on online communities, which is a part of my PhD foundation. Um, I studied Vine which was a child company to Twitter. And so I'm utilizing a lot of things that I learned in my iSchool education, as well as my dissertation in the, um, in the role that I have now building uh, communities at Twitter. And so I'm just so happy to be here. So happy to be able to share with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Kanila. That was so much new stuff I learned about you. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, and last but not least, we have Samuel. Samuel, go ahead, tell us about yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yana. Um, hi, everyone. Nice meeting you all. Um, my name is Somil. Um, and as Yana mentioned earlier, um, you know, I originally come from India. So I will start, uh, you know, my, my journey a little bit from there. Um, so I, I originally come from Mumbai. That's, a, again, another big city in India. And I did my, uh, I've pretty much stayed over there before mo moving to the United States. I did my schooling over there. Um, and then I eventually did my bachelor's in engineering over there as well. So I think during high school, uh, I was really passionate about uh, technology and mathematics. I think those were two areas that I was really uh, passionate about, which led me to, you know, towards engineering. Uh, and I, I come from a family where there are a lot of en engineers. Uh, my father is also an engineer. Um, he's done his mechanical engineering from India as well. Uh, so that was another, you know, uh, passion for me, which, which kind of led me to, towards uh, that space. Um, I did my bachelor's in electronics and telecommunication engineering from University of Mumbai. Uh, that was from two, 2013 to 2017. Uh, during my engineering, I think I worked on a lot of projects 
which were focused on data. Uh, I think that is something that got me excited into the space of analytics and data science. And I wanted to kind of pursue that uh, further ahead. Um, also, even during engineering, I think one of my favorite subjects has always been applied mathematics. And that's uh, another thing I wanted to kind of focus on uh, during my graduate studies was, you know, doing something in the field of statistics. And then after exploring a bit, you know, I, I realized that, you know, this is definitely something that I want to do. Um, I started applying to multiple universities in the United States to pursue my master's degrees. And um, I was very happy to get uh, selected by University of Illinois. And then I was a part of uh, the information science school. Uh, I did my master's uh, in information management with a specialization in data science uh, and analytics. Uh, during my master's, I took up a lot of foundational courses uh, revolving in that space, data science and analytics, you know, uh, machine learning, obviously network analysis is another course that uh, I took and I learned a lot from that as well. Um, statistics, I took programming classes as well because I do come from uh, an engineering background where I did not do a lot of programming. So that's something that I really wanted to learn uh, and understand more. Um, also, during my master's degree, I had the experience and the opportunity of working and doing multiple internships. So my first internship uh, during summer of my master's program was at John Deere, where I worked as a business analyst intern. So John Deere, again, you know, has, uh, has a facility in the research park where I was working mainly um, on areas like competitive intelligence and understanding the competitors of, of the industry and doing some analytics around that. Um, Apart from that, my second internship was again at the research park at another company that's country financial that was pretty much in the insurance space. And I was working over there as a data scientist intern, uh, where my focus was mainly on areas like, you know, machine learning and statistics. And I was working on a couple of projects over there with, uh, with a great data science team. Um, apart from that, also during my master's degree, you know, I had a great opportunity to work with uh, Yana and her entire team. Um, I was primarily focusing on a research that was uh, to understand and learn more about, you know, how uh, human, be human beings perceive certain information and how human beings behave. So my research was focused on, you know, enhancing the measurement of uh, social effects by capturing the morality of human beings. So I was working on that with Professor Yana and her team for around a year. Uh, I think that's one thing that I would definitely say helped me learn a lot about research. Uh, you know, usually as a master's student, because the program is so quick and accelerated, we do not necessarily always have the time to focus so much on research. And usually I've seen a lot of people who take just master's courses, but I think uh, working with Yana and her entire team got me into the, you know, uh, into the space of research where I was able to do some literature review, work on a certain research, which has always helped me a lot in my career. And then I finally graduated in 2019, which is just a couple of years ago uh, with my master's degree in information management. And then I was exploring opportunities. I wanted to be in the data science space, but I wanted to be uh, in a role where I can be a bridge between the technical teams and the business teams. Uh, and I had a great opportunity you know, to join Walmart where I'm currently working as a technical program manager for analytics. Um, I am a part of the global anti-corruption team that falls under the compliance space of Walmart. And the primary function of the global anti-corruption team is to kind of identify any kind of bribery, fraud or corruption, you know, that that can, you know, safeguard the company overall and then mitigate if there is any risk overall. And I work uh, mainly on leading and driving, you know, technical projects in the space of data science and analytics in that area. Um, I have been uh, with Walmart for around two and a half years now. I just completed two and a half years this month. Um, so that's just a little bit about, you know, my, my journey till here and my experience. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it was great to hear from all of you. I'll get us started here with a question. Um, and not all of the speakers have to respond to every question. So if you, if you find you have something interesting to say, just please go ahead. My first question for you guys is, what surprised you most about um, your data science career and industry? I can start. Um, it, it was the lack of discipline. <laughs> okay. Not not at intel intelligent medical objects. Okay, intelligent medical objects was very much a data driven company, but especially the the 
undisciplined way data was collected and used. If, uh, if a particular team needed to answer a question, they would cast a wide net, collect a lot of data that was unnecessary and consequently lower response rates because of it. So asking a whole lot of questions to generate a whole lot of data without having a clear idea of how they were going to use it. I would say um, scale, right? It wasn't until I started working at Meta that I realized how big <laughs> data sets were. I mean, billions of people, it's like you have to be in there querying databases to even conceptualize like how big some of the numbers are and, 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 and what it means. And, and so I think for me, that was the first time that I was actually exposed to so much data all at once. And so it was, it was unique and, um, and just fascinating at the same time. And things work a little bit different at Twitter, but just throughout my career, um, I would say scale was definitely something that was quite impressive. Um, I would just like to add to what, you know, Henry and Kenyatta just uh, mentioned. So I think one thing that definitely surprised me when I joined the industry, uh, especially, you know, working at Walmart, uh, when, I was, when I was doing my master's, obviously my focus was a lot on things like machine learning, you know, developing models, optimizing the models, feature engineering. I think uh, working in the industry for a couple of years now has uh, made me realize that, you know, there's a lot of time that goes that that is spent on, you know, obtaining data and obtaining the right amount of data, because there are so many systems that you're working with uh, and it necessarily, you know, it's not always necessary that you might know where the right data lies. So it's, I think there's enough time that goes into finding the right amount of data that you would want to use for the project or the initiative that you're working on. And then also after, you know, getting the data, I think there is enough time that goes into, you know, processing the data, cleaning up the data and making it usable before you actually start working on the exploratory data analysis or building any kind of models. So I think there's a lot of time that, that I believe in the industry that's spent on data because you're working with, you know, billions and billions of data as Kineta mentioned, and there are so many systems and uh, also, you know, data is not always in the format or shape that you would, you would want to use it in. So there's a lot of, you know, time that you need to spend on transforming and cleaning up the data as well. So I think that's something that definitely I have learned uh, by, by, you know, joining the industry. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else? Then I'll continue with the question from Jenna Perkins. Um, Jenna, do you want to read it yourself? Sure. Thank you so much, Yana. Um, my question is, would any of the panelists be able to speak to some of the distinctions among the various data science related position titles? Um, so data analyst versus data engineer versus data scientist. Um, and maybe what some of the differences in, in training or skill sets or sort of the day to day responsibilities would look like. I can start again and then hand it off to you, Snia, because I, I think there will be a handoff. Anyone can pass himself off as a data scientist. It's much harder to pass yourself off as a data engineer. And I'll hand that off to Snia because when we were at Intelligent Medical Objects, we were trying to hire data engineers. And throughout my, my whole internship, we probably interviewed a dozen people uh, who were all qualified data scientists, but knew very little about data engineering. I can continue from there. Um, um, I think it before I uh, describe what I think uh, they individually mean, I I want to caveat that by saying that they mean different in every diff every company. Um, for example, what data science uh, means at Meta is mostly a product analyst role and. Um, it's about it's a lot about um, it, the skills that are required are basic uh, is a lot of statistics and understand uh, how like you would interpret the data to make product decisions. Uh, the data engineers, on the other hand, don't uh, are uh, usually they can be, but usually they're not uh, such an expert in statistics side of things. They don't have to so much. They do have. They have to interpret the data, but uh, they're not as much an expert as data scientists. What uh, data engineers 
main focus is to be able to provide the data to the people who are looking for it to uh, basically enable their analysis, which means that I have to know what, um, like how reliable is the data that I, I'm providing to these people um are they coming in is the data coming in on time is the data clean um basically i know a lot about the underlying data but i don't day-to-day -day interpret the data as much and i leave that expertise to data science thank you does anyone else want to comment on that um, I would just like to add a little bit. I completely agree with, you know, what Henry and Sneha said, uh, especially, you know, the fact that, you know, these roles and these titles can, and as a student, even I was a bit confused about, you know, these different titles. Uh, and it also differs from company to company, as, uh, you know, uh, Sneha mentioned, rightly mentioned that uh, these, the roles can be, and the responsibilities can be quite different. Uh, I think from the way I look at it, obviously I've just, uh, you know, worked at Walmart, uh, up, except the few internships that I've done. But from what I understand is that, you know, a data engineer's job is primarily to ensure that, you know, um, the data is obtained in the right manner. So, you know, creating pipelines and making making sure that, we have uh, the best access to the data in the uh, you know the fastest access to data in the best possible way i think uh, a data scientist would definitely be focused on making you know understanding the data generating insights from the data uh, and there are different techniques that a data scientist would definitely use to generate those insights uh, you know from from data as well and then I think a data analyst job will be, you know, uh, partially to obviously also do exploratory data analysis, generate insights, and then to also, you know, do things like data visualization. That's also a very important thing in industry, you know, being able to visualize data. I think that would be more of a, a responsibility that would fall under uh, the data analyst, you know, title or responsibility overall. So I think that's how I differentiate it. But as I mentioned, you know, I think uh, I feel that these things could change completely um, from a company to another company. Thank you so much. Um, we got a great question from Meredith Olsen, and I'll read that. Um, or Meredith, do you want to do you want to read your question yourself? Sure, I'd be glad to. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. So my question is just given that you all have um, graduate degrees in you know, the fields that you're working in basically are really, really related fields. I imagine you've had colleagues who have different types of preparation, and I'm curious what your perspectives are on um, less formal preparation, like boot camps or, you know, online learning, that sort of thing. I'll start with this one. I think, um, I think all forms of education are uh, really important. And I would say that for me specifically, once you come in, if you could, they hire you because they believe you can do the job. And sometimes the credentials don't even matter. Once you come in, you have to earn respect. You have to, you know, <laughs> ensure, assure people that you belong there and that your data means something. And it's ultimately helping to really solve key questions and problems that the company is facing. And I think that when you can come in and can execute on those things, more and more degrees and preparation and how you got there matters less as long as you can execute when you are asked to. Well, I, I have a high opinion of boot camps. You know, it's an intensive way to, to learn the basic skills of data analytics and data science. And uh, two of my nieces, they had liberal arts undergraduate degrees and then went to data science boot camps and picked up some pretty good skills. Okay, I, I've actually contracted with my niece uh, for other projects because she was, I can't build a dashboard to save my life. Okay, but she was much better at data visualization than I am. And so I would push out work to her to get that done because she had learned how to do that in a boot camp. I am um, curious about like this question myself. Uh, from what I have experienced in my short career so far is I feel that um, having the right 
formal degree can maybe helpful when you're starting out um like when you don't have much experience to show um your resume if like for example to get an interview at all i think it matter it maybe matters there and i would uh like to uh know if others agree with this viewpoint or not i think like once you are there at the job then it really like once you have an interview for example then it really doesn't matter then it all boils down to whether you have the knowledge and i definitely think you can get the knowledge from less formal uh places of education um and i in fact in at intelligent medical objects we were also doing some udemy courses like they they thought that it was uh like important enough to uh for the job that we were doing the courses there i would also suggest that if um if there's something you you let's say you got hired at a company for something and but you can totally work on your end using these resources that you have instead of a formal degree and if your company allows like switch to another position uh that desired position in that company and once you have that experience to show um basically like it wouldn't matter the next time you apply whether you have a formal degree in it or not i think uh, my only take on this would be that you know i i um i do definitely believe that you know uh, formalized degrees are definitely important to uh, get interviews and get the job but especially you know in the world of data science and statistics i think things are evolving so fast year after year that uh, with that once you've started working in the industry uh without doing any kind of you know certifications or boot camps or taking up courses online courses i think it's very difficult to be able to learn new things uh, especially even if you want to grow in your career even if you have a formalized you know masters degree or a phd degree eventually once you are in the industry once you're working uh because things are evolving and changing so fast at the end of the day i think these boot camps and certifications and courses online courses are going to be very helpful and especially the good thing is that for data science i do regularly see that the the quality of content that's available uh for anyone out there even without a formalized degree is so good that you can really get all your foundational knowledge and skills even if you're starting off your career so i think definitely they do add to anyone's uh, career whether or not you have a formal degree in data science thank you also much for your oh go ahead go ahead meredith go ahead i was just going to say the same thing thank you for your responses i appreciate it yeah thank you that that was really interesting to hear um thanks so much sara uh um, mal we had a had another question sara are you here and want to read out your question yourself yeah sure um first of all, i'm really excited to join this session because it's the first time i'm um joining this forum uh, so i had a question regarding uh, what somil talked about uh, like how data is important that data should be used properly and should be um, so i'm usually curious about how the uh, ethics of uh, data collection and data processing is maintained in all the sectors um, specifically talking about um, the ownership privacy and transparency to the user how does it happen across in the industry um i'm sorry i had a bit of an unstable internet connection was that question for me because i read uh, in the chat or is that in general for the panel it is in general for the panel uh was i was i audible i'm so sorry i'm saying it it's i can, it was, I can uh, repeat your question sara um i think the question was uh, about the relationship between data science and ethics or ethical data science um what's your take on that how is ownership privacy transparency um ensured well i can take a stab at it because there was another question in the chat uh, addressed directly to me my comment about undisciplined data collection and over the years so i've been at intel now for 6 years since leaving illinois and I was shocked at how undisciplined they were with their use of data and it has improved a lot over the last 6 years partly because of ethical concerns that you're collecting data and 
that data might stick around and you might be collecting something that violates some kind of a regulatory, um, you know, some kind of regulation that's in place. If the data leaks, you're liable. And so as undisciplined as it was when I uh, first joined six years ago, it has improved significantly, a lot of it due to ethical and regulatory concerns. Yeah. So, uh, Go ahead, I was, Sophia. I was going to say, oh, Zara and Lauren, does that answer the question? That answers my the question that I posed. So thank you very much for okay. that, Henry. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I definitely agree uh, with Henry that a lot of things have definitely uh, improved a lot for the better now that there are actually external regulations as well uh, that audit um, a lot of data collection and data practices. Um, and there are uh, rules at every step that Zara mentioned. For example, there are rules around collection of data, don't collect data that uh, you are not going to use, uh, even if the user knows that you are collecting this data. If there's no need, don't collect it. Um, because as Henry said, like if it leaks, then it's bad. And uh, then there's also, there are also like rules around uh, data retention, that even if you have collected the data, this is how long you can keep it. Um, and then there is also, um, like the transparency that users should know what data is being collected. And I think like these are happening individually at the company level where companies have their own uh, rules around it, but they're also now being guided by external regulations. Thank you. Does any other of the speakers wanna add something to tech ethics? Well, thanks for sharing those perspectives. And I think um, one thing that both Henry and Sneha uh, pointed at is these regulations change all the time, but but your data don't. So if you know if you were compliant in 2014 for your data set on GitHub, um, the same data might not be compliant in 2016 anymore. So I'm speaking also from personal experience here. Yeah. Is anyone on the call from Soda? Is the Soda program still around? Nah, yeah. I mean, in a way, it it it. it it lent itself to the M MSIM degree. And um, I think we have a whole bunch of folks from the MSIM degree here. Because one of the most important things I learned at GISLIS was socio the socio-technical aspect of data. Okay, I didn't think it was important when I first joined, <laughs> but um, you have learned while I was there and have since learned how important the social aspect of data is. Thank you. And if I may, we also do teach courses, for example, in data governance and responsible computing and AI. Uh, we also have a speaker series on Friday mornings from 9 to 10 in responsible data science and AI, if people want to know more about um, that sort of thing. I have another question for you guys. I would want to know what other advice you have for people, students, or industry folks who are interested in data science jobs in the industry. Anything else you could... Um, um, let us know that that's helpful or, you know, good to know. This is uh, probably not specific for data science um, and also applies to other job positions is um, what I have really learned uh, so in my experience so far is that before starting a project, um, let's say somebody comes to you and says that, uh, can you do this or I need this? Uh, like think about the larger problem that you're trying to solve instead of what being asked of you. Um, always think like, what is the user impact of what, what uh, once you finish the work that you're doing? Make the uh, benefit to the user be the guiding factor for your work. Yeah, I would uh, kind of, piggyback on what Sneha is saying there. Um, in my role as a user experience researcher, I work with data scientists all the time, data engineers, et cetera. Um, something that I've come to realize too is that every piece of data is not always being recorded. And I think that's where those data engineers also do come in because they often create the pipelines in which makes data analysis possible to begin with. And wherein, you know, data science, they come in with the lovely diagrams and the large numbers. And then I love to pair also my expertise with actually getting in there, doing surveys, talking to the individual users to begin to try, uh, triangulate and create a narrative 
around what the data is saying, right? Because sometimes data can lie, sometimes it can be biased as well, but because it's such large in number, people don't question it as much as they would say an interview. And so um, I've learned to just continue to ask the hard questions about data, data and to really poke at it. And then also to realize that, um, you know, we are trying to solve business problems as Neha has said, and then how do the questions that we're trying to tackle level up to your team's goals and metrics and the different types of things that your company are also trying to lift, but not taking away from the user experience as well. You know, the storytelling aspect of data is critical. I think um, one of the things that I would like to add over here is, um, and obviously this is something that I have also learned in the last couple of years, um, is the interaction between you know data science and the business organizations of any company? Um, so as I mentioned, you know I work on a bus- on a business team within Walmart, and I think one of the things, one of my major challenges in my initial year has always been you know how to kind of help them understand on you know what exactly we are working on because. Uh, you might not necessarily be always working with people who might have extensive knowledge and understanding about data science, statistics, and machine learning. And uh, they might not definitely understand all the jargons and the terms that we use, especially, you know, even while creating a machine learning model, let's say if you are evaluating the performance, uh, there are terms like precision, recall, and FN score, and everything else that we use. Um, I think especially, you know, when you're working with business teams, they do not understand what exactly these performance metrics mean. So I think uh, one of the things and one of the major challenges that even I am kind of trying to, you know, learn from is how to kind of break down all of these things and simplify it in a manner that it's uh, easy for the leadership to understand, easy for the business teams to understand so that they are on a page with, you know, what you are kind of working on. And then you can bridge the gap between, you know, the the data science professionals and then the business teams who might not have extensive amount of knowledge in data science. I think that's one thing that I would definitely uh, mention to all the students that, you know, whenever you get an opportunity through internships or something, I think, you know, apart from the skill set that's core to data science, like, you know, programming languages and statistics and data analytics, Try to focus on some of these things, which will definitely give you an edge when you're applying to companies, because, you know, definitely there are so many people in the data science world that, you know, there's always, you know, having that edge will definitely help you when you're interviewing with uh, companies in general. Great. Thank you. Well, that was a refreshing hour. Um, We are pretty much at the end of of our hour we had together here. And I want to make sure everybody has enough time to transition to whatever their next commitment is. And if it's a walk in the snowy sun. Um, Thanks. uh, Thank you so much, Snia, Henry, Kenyatta and Samil for taking the time out of your schedules to hang out with us today, talk to us. I was also so delighted to see so many um, female identifying speakers on on uh, joining us here today and coming forward and ask questions and engage in conversations with us. If you have any follow up questions, um, I'd be happy to channel things. If anybody you know wants wants to have any more information or conversations, I'll put my email in here. If anyone wants to follow up on anything. Um, other than that, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day. For some of you, it's still early. For some of you, it's already pretty late. Um, and a great rest of your week. We will meet again on um, March, first Friday of March for this Data Science User Group. Everyone is welcome to, enjoy, uh, to join us. And big thank you again for our um, high school and U of I alumni to share their experiences and advice with us. It was so nice to see you again and get a chance to hear from about the great things you have done um, since you graduated and moved on to exciting careers in in industry. Thank you. Um, I'll stay here for a couple more minutes um, and I wish everyone else a great rest of your day.